fun. Thanks so much for being here today. So I think just right off the bat, when I heard I was going to be interviewing you uh, about this new trend of businesses and in integrating social responsibility into their business models and thinking, how ironic is that? You've been doing this since 1982 and not just giving away part of your proceeds, but 100%. You know, I'm probably two and a half times older than anybody out here right now. So we've <laughs> well, been... We won't make anyone do the math. <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, Paul started the company in 1982, uh, Paul Newman, and uh, he had, he was really a challenger company. That word wasn't around at the time. He had two uh, promises, if you will. One was that quality would come before any profit. And he didn't just mean the quality of our ingredients, that we're an all natural or organic food company but also the quality of the thinking of the company and the behavior of its people and in terms of being a citizen of the world. And uh, after that, the second promise was if there ever was a profit, you give 100% to charity. And What did you think of that idea right off the bat? We're, well, we're giving <clears throat> all the money away? I, w I actually wasn't there then. I okay. ran my own consulting company in the philanthropic field, and I thought, it's, it's an amazing idea. I hope it works. The people in the business community, business schools, thought it wouldn't work at all. And, uh, but here we are, 35, 36 years later, we have, we're a global company. We have over 300 products in the market. How do you scale, though, when you don't have profits? I mean, you've gone from one to th more than 300 products. Yes, yeah, <clears throat> indeed. That's one of our great challenges is that um, access to capital is not easy for us. Uh, so all of our scaling has been done through organic internal growth. Mm -hmm. um, there was recently a law passed that recognizes our kind of company. So we're hoping that we, based on that, can do a little more external financing and bring in people. I have some ideas on that and maintain the 100% of profits of charity. But <clears throat> the, the fact is that over the time, you know, we've now been able to donate over $540 million to charities all over the world. Uh, 2018 was 27.5 million. It will be by the end of the year. And, uh, and we've, I guess, you know, Paul never started out to prove anything. He just wanted to, he had a good salad dressing. He wanted to sell it <laughs> and he wanted to have some fun with it. Uh, I mean, it was, he was reluctant early, right? To put his face on it. He was told if, if he ever thought this would, anybody would try it, that he'd have to put his face on it. Paul was a man of just painful humility. He just didn't want anything to be about himself. You know, being a celebrity was like wearing a, a wool suit in July on a New York subway. He was just uncomfortable <laughs> that way. And so when he was convinced to do that, he uh, said, okay, that's when I'll give it all away. And he actually coined a lo uh, uh, slogan at that time, uh, shameless exploitation for the common good, which kind of assuaged his guilt about <laughs> his having his face on it. But as you heard earlier, you're not going to sell a product or a service unless that product or service is really good and competitive. That's particularly true in the food business. Uh, people right. just people don't, don't like it, they won't buy it. They don't like it, they won't buy it. And we're not a boutique, a niche player. We compete against General Mills, Kraft, PepsiCo, Unilever in the big category. So yeah, we have a good product. Mm -hmm. but, but what do you think drives sales today? I mean, does Paul Newman's celebrity still weigh in or is it or is it the phil philanthropic aspect of, yeah. of the fact that you give away all your or profits or is it just the products are really good yeah, well i think it's all of it you know paul paul himself just did not want to be a celebrity so he did not promote himself as such so he actually i knew him for about 16 years and his celebrity uh, recognition was dropping off we would be walking down the street and you would see people look and I said, oh, here it goes again, an autograph. And somebody would run up and say, you're the popcorn guy, aren't you? And, and Paul, <laughs> oh, you know, he was happy with that. Uh, however, it's produced a bit of a problem for us because you won't get any, you get under 40 years, uh, it, it really falls off fast. And I think what we're really trying to do now is to understand, you know, bring out the fact that we are 100% authentically from the beginning. We don't support charity to sell food, we sell food to support charity. And I think that's an important message for us to get out. Uh, what, what do you support? Talk to us about the different um, organizations that you give your profits to. Well, we, we have four big windows that we look through. You can take an aircraft carrier and drive it through, they're so big. One is simply encouraging philanthropy. And we deliberately use the word philanthropy and more, 
And when people in other institutions begin to say, no, let's use another word, we even use philanthropy more because for us that's the, uh, the true north of what we're doing in purpose. And it really keeps us uh, you know, focused. It helps us with our associates and everything else. Um, so, so we're kind of, and philanthropy simply means the love of humankind. And as Paul said, why, why should you feel embarrassed about saying that? It's, it's very, very simple. Uh, and uh, then we do children with life-limiting conditions. We have medical camps all over the world for children with uh, anything from pediatric oncology or hematology to the very rare orphan diseases like progeria, where there are only 16 wow. children in all of North America with progeria. Wow. So think of that. And uh, they come to camp with their parents. So these summer camps? Or they <clears throat> they're they residential right camps. We okay. have camps in hospitals. There are about 140,000 children a year. We have them all over the world in the developing world. Um, nutrition, which I always tell people is um, a bit ironic for a company that makes Alfredo sauce and con queso and stuff like that. But well, we also believe in... for you, right? Yeah, we believe in choice. So, you know. <laughs> We have a lot of good products, too, and uh, go for the In moderation. Right? In moderation. And then empowerment, which for us is uh, the, the idea of... Paul was a great believer, as I am, in the role that luck plays in our lives. You might use another word, that's fine, but it's the luck of circumstance that... Paul would say, I was lucky to be born in America with all the opportunities that afforded me. And I was lucky to look right for the movies. And he, I had nothing to do with either one of those things. So think about... The child born in poverty, the child born in the slums of India or Africa, or the veteran that returns and has been blinded, or you know any any number of things. Uh, so that for us empowerment is to help whatever we can do to reduce the barriers of circumstance. Then it's up to that person, he or she, to see what they can do with their potential. So that's what we do. I know you also try to encourage other. Um corporations to yeah. give away right. some or all of their profits. And you helped uh, found something called CECP, the Committee mm -hmm. Encouraging Corporate Philanthropy. Right. Talk about that advice that you that you give to these other companies. And are, are many of them following suit? How, how t it's tough. I mean, well, very few are giving away 100%. Are any of them? No, and they can't. A public company, if you're you, you all have stock, whether you know it or not. They're in your pensions and everywhere else, and you'd probably be upset if they were giving away all your profits. Mm -hmm. um, but I, the way this started, and they're, depending on where you were, who you were, and when it got started, for me, it was I got a phone call from pa, Paul one day, and, and this is how phone calls would go with Paul. He'd say, Forrester, uh, I got an idea. He and another guy were going to go out and buy blocks of shares in public companies, and go harangue CEOs and threaten to show up at their annual meetings if they didn't give them more money away. My answer was, well, Paul, uh, just think that you're, you know, a, kind of a liberal movie guy sitting in front of CEO. I don't think that's really going to make much of a dent. So what do you do? I said, well, CEOs are not born in an orchard. They are, they are people. They've come up, you know, through the, they want to do more. They truly do. I, I entered my career through being in corporate relations at a university. Um, we have to encourage it, support it, and actually break down the barriers that stand between a company and participating. One of the greatest barriers, and we're just about, well, we've really begun to move to break this down, is short-termism. That has really been one of the great, insidious, pernicious kinds of damage. What, what is that? What is short-termism? Well, short-termism, you know, there was one time when you looked at a company. I grew up in the Hartford community, and we had 32 corporate headquarters. All of the stock was owned by employees, the families that founded the companies, the institutions. Stocks got aggregated in the 70s and the 80s into big money funds, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the interest then was quarterly earnings. That was short-termism. And that led to a whole bunch of things, including that the culture of CEOs coming up through the company was broken. Uh, you were out the door. You know, the tenure of a CEO was different. Uh, the the long-term... Uh, investment value was, uh, came a distant second to long-term value creation. Right now, one of the things CECP has done through the Strategic Investors Initiative, it's, it's brought together uh, the big money funds, including uh, BlackRock and CalPERS and TIA. A, I think there's about $25 trillion worth under management by these companies that are now pushing the long-term aspect 
And this will really, because companies want to do more, uh, they're not going to go up to 100%, but if they could go from 1% where they kind of, the needle has been stuck, to 2%, that's an enormous billions of dollars uh, that goes into actually making for a more competitive uh, business environment. You know, if, if you don't have nonprofits out there, you're going to have tax dollars through governments out there. Think about that. So that's what it's all about. You know, there was an article recently um, where you talked about your corporate culture at Newman's Own, mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask you a question about that. In, in the article, you said, that's been hard because sometimes the culture gets in the way of making money. There are things we could right. do that would make us more money, but it just doesn't feel right. So mm -hmm. tell us about that. What were you talking about? Well, a good, good example would be, you know, Paul, his philosophy was, if I'm not going to be around in the future, I have no right telling anybody in the future how, what they should do. So he did not leave me a manual. Some days I wish he did, uh, I really do. So it, but, but on the other hand, that was a wonderful gift from Paul. Um, we, all of our food is our formula. Uh, you, know, we, you come to Newman's Own and we have three of our fellows out here, I think Newman's Own fellows, uh, and we're testing our foods. Uh, you're, you're our focus group. We're all sitting around test. Actually, I missed one today, and I'm really upset about that. <laughs> well, so one of the value propositions is that we can make a lot more money, and there's an argument on behalf of that, if we just merchandise our brand. And we you know, began to put it on all sorts of other products. But then we've moved away from the authenticity of who we are. Mm -hmm. And I think once you begin down that slope, you're also you've opened the door to make other kind of compromises along the way. It's, next thing you know, maybe it's 90% to charity and you know, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, at some point, I give up Newman's Own uh, and my current board, and uh, we just have to hope that we've imbued into our associates the same feel, so when they make these decisions, they'll have the opportunity to do the same thing I'm doing. That feel will come into play, but ultimately, there's, there's always a bit of competitiveness between the business imperative and the philanthropic imperative. We keep it at what we call a constructive tension. Uh, Newman Zone is actually owned by a grant-making foundation, and the, the new law that got passed in February mandates that at the end of the, any decision-making that the charitable purpose will dominate over the business purpose. But that doesn't necessarily mean the value proposition purpose. You know, that's up to the board of directors. Now, before we go to questions, I, I did want to ask you if, if you, there was one thing that you could point to that you've learned over the last 36 years of, of Newman's own that, that you would like to share with, with folks here in the room or those watching um, online about corporate social responsibility. What, what would you share? Well, I, I would share, and this is my view, is it make it authentic. Um, you know, as I said earlier, we, we uh, sell products to support charities. We don't support charities so we can sell more products. Um, and there is a line there. And uh, if you really want to have the full power of, of a socially responsible, highly regarded company, uh, really make it authentic. Uh, you know, believe in what you're doing, make it the true north. Um, don't just try to find that charity, if you will, if you are, I'm just talking the philanthropic part of it, that is just gonna do good things for your marketing, if you will. Um, I've seen too many times where that's hurt both the company and the charity in the process. And um, so I'm a CEO, I've been CEO of a couple of companies. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, each each company will own, find its own way. But my, if this is a place you want to be known for, you really want to have a, an impact, be as authentic and honest uh, with your approach as you possibly can, and that will pay off in the long run because at some point, we will get media attention about things that were really not philanthropic, let's say, or things that were just done for a more narrow interests, but. We're not, you know, preachers to others. That's never been our position. So that's what I would say, but do whatever you want. But, but you're great models. <laughs> yeah. So let's go to well, the... As long as you don't talk about my personal life, we're, yeah, we're okay. <laughs> let's go to the audience for questions. We sure. have one back here. Hi, Bob. Simeon Hi. Braxton from the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. Hi. 
I wanted to ask about your fellowship program. What motivated, number one, for you to do that, for your organization to launch one? And then what has been the impact for your organization and the fellows? Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're a bit eccentric at our decision-making. We can make it pretty fast. I was on a board, and still am, of a university. And the, the student regent, um, who was just graduating, came and asked me for a, to do a career interview. And in the process, she was... Uh, recruited to have a really good management job, but there was a six-month period that she uh, wouldn't be getting into the uh, training session, her training program. And I asked her what she was going to do in between, and she said she didn't know, and I asked her if she wanted to be a fellow. And she said, what is that? I said, I'm not really sure. I just made it up, but I, <laughs> I, we do a lot of that at Newman's Own. And, but there was, there was something that really you know, said to me, this is, a, this is kind of a wonderful thing, and... and uh, and what we do is we, we're getting people right out of college, not with the idea that to expose them into the nonprofit sector in a substantive way. And we don't really care where they go, whether they go into the nonprofit sector, the corporate sector, teachers. We want them to touch that real experience as I have in my life and take it with them. Um, we're now, we now have. Uh, I think 14 fellows uh, this year. Uh, and what we do is we place them with nonprofits uh, as well as we have an enrichment program on, on top of that. Um, we're still too young to uh, really say how this is going, although many of them have actually changed their career objectives and come back into the nonprofit sector. We're delighted by that. But one of the uh, ways we think also is that you know, real, true impact, we don't say we measure impact, we evaluate it, because true impact on these young people, we won't know what that is until they're somewhere in the middle of their adult lives, their career lives, and, and that type of thing. So that's, that's our program. Uh, I'll tell you, it's just wonderful to have younger people like that around. We were trying to figure out how to get to the young generation and digital, and we all sat around the room for about a year, and we're all well, at least over 50, and in some cases, a lot older than that. My oldest employee, by the way, is 101 years old, but we won't go there. Wow. And every year, as he asks me for a raise, I say, a raise? I'll give you a bonus. Uh, <laughs> just for, for having the chutzpah of asking. Uh, but so, and I also realize we have all these fellows. Come, let's bring them in and talk to us. So uh, it's really been enriching for me and, and the, uh, those of us who have been around for a fellow. So nothing like your fellowship program, but we certainly respect and know what you do. Yeah. Thank you. All right, another question? Um, so I, I was wondering when you were <clears throat> talking about measuring results, how, do you measure the results that you achieve then in the organizations who you give your profits to? Well, let me give you an example, I think, and there were so many, but um, about 10 years ago, a, a couple of young really young, they're 21 and 22 year old college kids came to see us. Uh, one of them grew up in the largest slum in Africa called Kibera, it's outside of Nairobi. And uh, they had this idea, and this is a slum that you just can't imagine, you have to be there. Um, and they were totally unfundable from any traditional point of view. But as I listened to them, and they wanted to start with a girls' school on the basis that a, if you can, you deal with little girls in this area, it'll bring along the family, it'll bring along the community. So by educating the girls, mm -hmm. by giving them opportunity, okay. uh, by bringing respect to them and giving them opportunity. Um, Ten years later, they're now serving 220,000 people through water stations, health clinics, um, gender committees, small, we started 1,300 micro businesses. A micro business is like a cardboard box with food on it through a women's cooperative bank. The girls graduate eighth grade and they just graduated last December. I was their commencement speaker over there. It was just a wonderful experience. Wow. Um, they have all gone on to high school. They've won the poetry contest of all of Kenya four years. Uh, five of them are studying now at, in the United States, uh, one at Miss Porter's, one at Westover, one at Stony Burnham, one at um, 
Loomis Chafee in Hartford, and another the poor thing is up at uh, Buffalo. It's, <laughs> she has never seen snow before. Burr. She loves it. <laughs> so, but, but the idea, that's how we fund. We want to be a risk taker. We're not an organization that can bring great scale. Um, but by being a risk taker, and we have a bit of an advantage with our brand because our brand is respected in the grant making space. We can convene others into the interest. In fact, this, if I can briefly, oh, yeah. this, this uh, organization, after we gave them the first grant, they began to get grants from other uh, organizations. And they asked if we would name the school. And we don't name things that, that's, you know, we try not to have it about us, but they convinced me that having the name Newman Zone would be helpful for uh, attracting other funders. So we named the toilet. We now have, what? yeah. So we ha now have 46 toilets in, in, in <laughs> Kibera, and I'm hoping for more. And when I go to, and, and the thing that I learned over there is the, everybody talks about local ownership, but frequently what you miss in that is maintaining the dignity of the people uh, so when important. you go in in local ownership, because these toilets are important. And even though there are a million people packed into the area the size of Central Park without any services whatsoever, each one is like New York City. You don't, people live in New York City don't say, I live in the city, I live in the West Village, the East Village, Soho, Noho, whatever the case may be. I actually have to go, my wife and I, and have our picture taken with the toilets. The toilets. And the, and, and, <laughs> but, it, but, you know. That's making it, a difference in people's lives. Making a difference also does something else. It's the great pleasure we can have out of it. You know, running Neiman's Own is tough. It's a competitive business. We get beat up. We have to innovate, compete. Mm -hmm. We pay our corporate taxes like anybody else. Uh, but boy, did we ever draw energy and, and just, you know, we're a purpose-driven organization. We get out there and do those things. So uh, that's another Paul reason say? I say. Hmm? What would Paul say? I mean, this, this year marks the 10th anniversary yeah. of his death. Um, what would he say if he saw where you are today? Yeah, well, that was actually my promise to Paul. You know, he, he, uh, he, he would say to me, what's going to happen when I croak? And I would say, well, I don't know, you may croak before me. And, and finally, we got around to it. I said, well, if you ever came back 10 years from now, uh, it would feel right to you. So there was, inherent in that was two promises. Being a business, we had to still be here. And we had to keep innovating, competing, and doing all those things. But being a philanthropy, the values, there's nothing more than values, these are not, not a written code, would still prevail in things. So I think he would probably say, okay. I mean, he wasn't a man of a lot of words. And, uh, he, and, or he would say things like, when we would tell him how much we were able to give away, he would say things, wow, that's a lot of salad dressing or something. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's all you got from Paul. <laughs> so I think he'd be fine with it. Yeah, I really do. He'd be, I okay. Hope. He'd be okay. He'd be okay. Great. Thank you so much, oh, thank Bob. You. I really appreciate it. Great interview. <laughs>